saying that the reason why we did this in the United Arab Emirates was because it provided a very interesting context. Um, the women uh, were largely uh, absent from public life until recently. Uh, and so a lot of the development that is going on is sometimes seen as a threat to the to the traditional to society, to the traditions, to the culture of the UAE. Um, uh, at the same time, we know that um, we know that uh, there's a lot of modernity going on. Of course, everybody hears about Dubai, uh, but all across the UAE, there's uh, a lot of push for um, kind of. Um, uh, being different from the rest of the Middle East and um, being more modern um, and so on. And uh, also there's a lot of uh, push for putting uh, gender empowerment up front. Uh, the Ministry of State for Federal and National Council of Affairs website says that one of its goals is to establish a new benchmark for gender empowerment in the region, not only in the UAE. Uh, and as well, um, there's a lot of investment in women education. Um, there's been um, uh, more, you know, a, a lot of growth from 2012 to 2018. Uh, for example, the percentage of enrollments by women rose from 42% to 58%, even though still the global gender gap index is still low in the UAE, but there's been a lot of improvement in the recent years. Uh, we also know that um, the United Arab Emirates used uh, women and the images of women for rebranding the UAE, uh, the so-called competitive identity where they try to distinguish themselves from the other uh, Arab countries in the Gulf especially uh, by showing that um, their women are in the forefront. For example, the Air Force female pilot um, Al-Mansouri was often discussed as this um, strong woman that attacked ISIS. Um, so uh, that's why it provided a very interesting um, context in terms of kind of this um, uh, mix between traditional values and uh, a very careful approach to modernity, at the same time a push for modernity and trying to uh, distinguish themselves in terms of gender empowerment. Um, we also know that uh, from research that uh, women in leadership positions in UAE that showed stereotypically made uh, tra male traits had higher chances to be professional successful. It's not surprising. Um, uh, probably you'll find similar research elsewhere where women that kind of try to be like men uh, and not too weak, uh, not too feminine, <laughs> were, uh, were perceived as stronger candidates and stronger politicians. Um, the view of women in the UAE has changed in recent years, uh, whereas in the past they were seen only as uh, literate housewives and uh, more recently uh, there's a lot of discussions of them being citizens with full rights. Um, and we know from one of the studies that uh, it's not only gender that played a role in uh, how um, females perceive uh, power roles, that age as well played a role, uh, and that kind of precluded uh, why we were interested in more than one identity in studying this topic. Um, so what do we know uh, about kind of mass media, female gender, and um, politics? Um, just a few studies. We know that um, women politicians were disadvantaged in press coverage. You can see it both in Western media and in Arab media. Um, we know that minorities, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic women in British politics, uh, just a, a recent study found had, adv it had a, an advantage in terms of press coverage, in terms of how much attention they were getting, but the content was exceptionally negative. Um, and um, what we know in terms of social media is that um, perhaps it allowed uh, some more opportunities that mass media didn't allow, whereas uh, you know, there was maybe li limited coverage and if there was limited coverage, it was negative. But on social media, uh, women could shape their own messages and put out as many as they wanted. Uh, at the same time, a study of social media used by female parliamentaries in 107 countries 
showed that um, almost 50% of women received insulting and threatening comments about their abilities and role. And that's not only in the Middle East, it's across the world. Um, and so um, not surprising that personal stories are often avoided by women uh, to avoid this kind of uh, personal insights, uh, insults. Uh, <clears throat> that was a study from 2016. So all of this kind of uh, was a, um, why we were interested in social media uh, and not only in how women uh, shape their messages, but how women perceive those messages and whether that uh, helps them to, um, to, to, to get to be more confident and um, gives idea of what they could do in their life. And uh, we used the theoretical uh, framework, first of all, of feminist scholarship, of course, where we see that a lot of criticism is um, about ignoring various identity, that a lot of research looks on the agenda and doesn't really take into consideration that not all women are the same, that ethnicity, nationality, class, and other identities may play a role. And as, a, as an example, one of the studies in the Middle East uh, of um, uh, organ sort of organizational professional communication showed that um, identity was influenced by religious beliefs and culture. How women viewed themselves was very much influenced by religious beliefs and culture and that kind of pull and push um, relationship between them. Um, so that's why we used intersectionality theory and that comes, uh, intersectional theory builds on critical race theory. Um, Crenshaw uh, is the one that uh, developed it and really looked uh, uh, at how race and gender interact to shape the multiple dimensions of black women's employment experiences. Uh, and the rationale is because this experience cannot be captured only by looking at race or gender dimensions separately, that they are intertwined. So uh, she highlighted the need to account for multiple grounds of identity when considering how social world is constructed. And um, uh, of course, after uh, the initial uh, kind of uh, publications that she had, uh, intersectionality, th intersectionality theory was used in beyond just um, um, only the context of black women, but in other contexts as well. And that's why we also um, chose it. Uh, the, a lot of the times intersectionality theory was used to bring the often hidden dynamics forward in order to transform them. So the whole idea was to interrogate the social structure and see how power is um, uh, constructed and used. Um, so um, intersectionality theory suggests that there are three uh, types of intersection intersectionality. One is structural, so how uh, legal status, living conditions, employment opportunities, and violence um, is uh, used uh, to uh, disempower, to um, oppress women. And there's political intersectionality, and that looks in uh, terms of um, kind of political structures, law being politicizing violence against women. So you were using women for political goals. And then there is representational intersectionality, and that is how women are presented in culture imagery. And the representational intersectionality is really what we primarily focused on. Uh, but of course, keeping in mind the structural and the political intersectionality as well. Um, so the research question that we had was how do Emirati females make sense of gender, ethnicity, and age in their discussions of the United Arab Emirates female politician messages on social media? So in other words, we wanted to see how women politicians are perceived by young Emirati women in social media. We used the qualitative approach. Uh, we used focus groups, um, conducted all in all five focus groups for this particular study. And there were between 22 and 39 minutes. The average length was about 33 minutes. And then we recorded them, transcribed and coded. And we used uh, open axial and selective coding technique uh, discussed widely by Corbin and Strauss. Um, and uh, in terms of the actual focus group, there were two parts where we had in the first part a general discussion about 
social media use and women politicians. Do they know women politicians? How do they perceive them and so on? And then we, in the second part, we looked at specific postings of two women politicians. And we chose two out of prominent um, nine uh, female ministers. So there are a total nine female ministers in the UAE cabinet. And six of them had Instagram accounts, and we chose two out of six that had the largest following. And they were Noura al Kabi, who is the Minister of Culture and Youth, and she had uh, 138,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, this is her page, um, and, she, and then um, this is her Instagram account. So after the first part of the focus group, we asked um, the participants to open the Instagram account and look through her post so we could just discuss them. And then the other one is Shamal Mazru, and she's a minister of state for youth. Uh, she had a following of three to 300 to 24,000 followers on Instagram. And it's her picture and her profile on the government website, and that's her Instagram account. Uh, these are pictures that I took just a couple of days ago. As you can see, they have the masks, but this happened. We collected data a year ago, so um, the, the, the posts were a little different. Um, so now I'll talk a little about results. Uh, what we found out in terms of the overall use of social media is that um, young Emiratis use various uh, various um, platforms to get news. Uh, the most popular ones were Instagram. Uh, I didn't list Snapchat, but Snapchat was mentioned quite a lot in that area, and then WhatsApp and uh, a bit l less on Twitter. Um, and then participants knew about women politicians and we asked them where they know them from. So a lot of them said from mass media, especially during election times, there's a lot of um, discussion um, and then also from social media. And uh, they also follow male politicians and quite a few mentioned male politicians, especially royal family sources, um, which sort of is expected in that area because they do give a lot of respect and uh, not, not to mention them would be almost disrespectful. Uh, and many participants use social media for, of course, fashion, news, entertainment, and gossips. So I'll, I'll discuss this a little bit further later um, in terms of, you know, primarily their use of social media is not really for political news. So then we looked, of course, in terms of uh, the different uh, identities and how they emerged in the focus group discussions. And one of them was gender and age. Um, um, the participants discussed, of course, uh, age as an important um, kind of um, identity that they could relate to. So the Minister of Youth, Shafa Mazru, was often discussed as the youngest in the government. And Nur El Kaabi was talked about as somebody who they could identify with because she was also a student. So, for example, in one of the discussions, I said, so you mentioned that these women have similar characteristics like you. Is there a way they're different? They're not like you. One of the participants said, I think they're similar because we live in the same country. We are the same. And another participant confirmed. Nora, she was like student like us, so she maybe feel what we feel and she has same opinions and the other one, Shama, she's 20 like us, maybe we'll have the same idea, understand each other, even though she was 22 when she was appointed, but she was relatively young and close in age. Uh, in terms of gender, they talked about overall kind of change that um, when they see women, they feel that change is coming. For example, when I said, so what do you feel when you read those news about women in UAE government? They said there is change. Women can be empowered, like they care about women. So they felt that there is a change and that government, you know, take care of them. And they talked a lot about support from government, sort of this uh, structural support uh, that uh, government encourages women, that government provides support for women to develop. Uh, and they did see women figures and inspiring and empowering. 
So when they see a woman, they say, when it's a woman, it's different because we want to be like her. And this refers to the question when I asked them, so if it was the news about men, uh, a male figure, would it be the same? And they said, no, it's when, when it's a woman, it's different because we want to be like her. And one of the participants said, we see men, men, men everywhere. So it's, it's not <laughs> interesting anymore. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of participants talked about um, women politicians as working hard. She worked hard and that was really uh, kind of an overall theme throughout the focus groups that they, these women work very hard. Um, and then, uh, of course, there was um, uh, what I believe is a, a, is a mix, is an intersection of gender and nationality. And here they talked a lot about family, um, that family name and family support is very important for women politicians to be there and for women to be successful overall. So at the same time, they said that, you know, not every woman uh, can be in this position uh, in the, in a, as a politician. They said, women politicians don't come from the society, they're chosen. How can we be someone like that? Can I be in the future in that position also? I can't. Uh, and that refers to the idea that the, the, these women are not really um, elected. They don't come kind of, uh, they don't have the same political processes. They are appointed and a lot of the times they are part of royal families. Um, family name was perceived as very important and uh, it can be used for professional development and it can be used for, uh, to, to kind of find positions in, in the government or elsewhere. Uh, and especially father's name is important. Uh, and then father support is important for professional development. A lot of women talked about how uh, other families don't allow to work somewhere, uh, but their father allows that. So for example, I totally agree with them, that culture affecting us negatively meaning, but my family is not like that. My dad is motivating us and supporting us. He thinks that you must educate yourself first. So she was talking about education, how important it is to professionally develop. And then there was an interesting kind of intersection between gender, nationality, and profession. Um, the participants talk about women politicians as boring. So women politicians, even though their image is sort of interesting and inspiring, but their uh, messages are boring. And women politicians were viewed as presenters. They were not talked about as professionals, as somebody who's knowledgeable about society, about uh, politics, uh, as competent uh, uh, diplomats. So for example, uh, one discussion was, we know about her break and what she was like. Coming from that Thing, but not going to government sector because it is boring. You end up a minister or presenter at event or something. So a minister was almost the same as a presenter at an event. So they didn't really understand what it was to be a politician. And then another uh, girl confirmed, yeah, she just got a picture and she explains what this is. This is not interesting. And so then- Lisa, Lisa yeah? I just wanted to say you're at 20 minutes now. So if you want time for some questions, yeah, I'm Not almost finished. Left. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And so, sorry. Um, uh, also, they talked about women politicians lacking critical writing. So they said, we want to see more criticism, not just um, information. And then um, a lot of uh, women referred to politicians don't, not having a personal life. Uh, so they didn't see that in posting, and I'm not going to read the uh, conversation, but basically they were talking about um, women not sharing anything about their personal life, so they couldn't really connect to that. Um, uh, so uh, let me just quickly say that the, they also talked about public speaking skills of women politicians, and I guess this refers, again, uh, relates to the, them being as kind of um, just presenters rather than politicians. And in terms of the implications, what I would like to talk about is that basically what um, uh, it seems to be the case is that women figures images were perceived as empowering. However, the posts were not necessarily empowering. So the figures were, they could identify visually that these are Emirati women and young, but the posts were about politics. They were not about gender. They were not about um, anything relating to the age. Uh, or not a little bit about nationality, actually more so about nationality, but not so much about the other identities. So what we can
can make out of it is that posts were difficult to identify with and they lacked intersection of gender, age, and nationality. So we can say that there was a lack of um, a lot of representational intersectionality in terms of images, but there's lacking intersectionality in messages. And that hasn't been really discussed in previous literature, what it means in this case to be young Emirati woman and politician. Uh, and then another theoretical implication is that family seems to be also part of this structural intersectionality. So in order to uh, develop, in order to grow in a profession, in order to have opportunities, you need to support the family. So this is also something that hasn't been yet uh, explored in, uh, and probably because this area of the world is so particular in terms of family structure as a unit. So that's about it. Um, thank you very much. And sorry that I went over time. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. And, and yeah, I, I warned you in the in the chat, but I should probably have told you more like up front. So, so I'm sorry about that as well. Yeah, um, I think when you present, you don't see a chat, so it doesn't come up in my... <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So um, that's on my part then. But thank you for a very interesting presentation. And uh, we have time for, I think that I'd like to raise a question that has come up uh, from several uh, people in the chat uh, concerning uh, the uh, the concept of empowerment and, and, and whether um, the idea of uh, empowerment um, that that the researcher has uh, corresponds to, uh, to the ideas of empowerment uh, among the people that you researched. Um, so could you give a bit of reflection about that, the, the concept of empowerment and how that um, translates from the research to the participants in the study? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, the purpose was to look into empowerment, but we didn't really uh, use so much the word empowerment, but, but I did ask, and of course, there's no, I can't include everything in the presentation, but we did ask what it means to be empowered. And uh, from the data, the most of the participants were saying to have the opportunities to be strong, and they used the word uh, to um, have freedom to choose not to be oppressed, one girl said. So this was, this was how they identified empowerment. Even though, um, even though the purpose was there, we didn't really, you know, our interest was more into the identity and how uh, these identities played out in sense making, not so much about whether you feel empowered. But we did ask that question. And if, um, if you think it's important, I, I guess we can include it in the paper as well. It seems like several of uh, the listeners here have been kind of, uh, well, go, gone in that direction and have been inspired by that, that thought. So I invite you to, to look into the chat. There are more questions and it would be great if you would do, go in and, and, and have a conversation and then continue it there. So mm -hmm. for now, I, I just say thanks a lot for a very interesting study. And we'll move on to the next presenter, uh, which is uh, Anna Christina Susina from Loughborough University of London, and she'll be talking about uh, is media activism a kind of poor journalism? So the floor is yours, Anna Christina. Uh, thank you, Carrie. <clears throat> uh, thank you all. Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very happy to be here in this, in this discussion, um, in, this, in this conference. And I will share my screen here. Those. Yeah, there it is. Um, so I think uh, first thing I want to say is that well, this study, it was not originally conceived to discuss journalism in itself because well, it was focusing in in media practices in grassroots social movements and communities in in Brazil. And if you look uh, into the paper, or even during this presentation, you are, you will find that maybe the theoretical framework is not uh, well. It comes from a different uh, place, from studies about grassroots movements and, and grassroots um, communication and media. But um, what? Why I'm bringing it here? Because well, and indirectly and without searching. Uh, for it. I get read a lot of data about uh, how these social grassroots actors understand, perceive, and challenge mainstream journalism. So without searching for it or without pushing it, the subject appeared with a high frequency uh, in the field. 
and people would be always making reference to what they think about journalism, mainstream journalism, and how they in, how they try to create other push, create and push other models of doing journalism in the country. And well, I believe this is important because it adds to my original argument about uh, media movements that I will uh, explain later. Um, but I think also it is in, and I think it, oh, this, this, this argument, it relates a bit with the interventionist model that we saw yesterday in the present, presentation of the book. But I think it's also important because it brings a perception of these social groups that are, that are frequent, frequently uh, invisible or stereotyped by main, mainstream media. Uh, and, relate, and it relates a bit with what Francisco Brandão uh, was also discussing yesterday. So uh, just to have a bit of context, I think we are unfortunately very used already to this image of Brazil as a country with, uh, a, very, with a highly concentrated media sector. And in 2017, the Media Ownership Monitor found among, among other things, that just five groups or their individual members concentrate more than half of the media in national level in Brazil. And a collection of, of features that we can see in this, in this uh, table, in this image, um, shows how the country is in a situ situation of high risk in terms of media plurali pluralism. Um, I want to add another level to this discussion, another layer to the discussion, to this problem. And I share with you this notion of desert of news that comes from a report also from 2017. And it means that uh, no local information at all um, produced uh, in an organized and regular basis in all this yellow part of the map that we are seeing here. So this is this yellow part is what the researchers call desert of news. And we are talking about 35% um, of Brazilian population not having access to any local production of information. Um, I won't advance a lot on these numbers. If someone is interested, we can discuss it later and also about what, what difference it makes to have digital platforms in this kind of context, but uh, considering time uh, limitations here, I want just to, to present this, this context so you have it in mind while I'm presenting the, uh, the, my other reflections. And again, why am I here uh, coming from this discussion about grassroots media and, and trying to make this dialogue related with mainstream journalism? Um, as I'm, I was saying, journalism plays a central role in the field of grassroots media as a reference, as a model, as a form of oppression, and is in general as a tension. I would say that uh, besides uh, talking about, particularly about their practices, talking about mainstream journalism was the most frequent topic of conversation during the exchanges that I have during my field research. And exploring the rex reflexivity of these field actor actors, I want to discuss this tension regarding the agency over journalism and the mobilization of knowledges in this, in this field. So, so you have an idea about whose actors I'm talking about. I've been working with 55 communicators. This is what, how I call them. You can also call them media activists if you, if you want. Related with 29 grassroots media initiatives in six different regions in Brazil, in Brazil as you can see in the, in the map. And I observed their practices and interviewed them from 2013 to 2017. Uh, getting a bit into the findings, they, what we can see is that they compete with mainstream journalism, even if when they don't want to do it. They are frequently compared 
to journalism, and but this is mainly to delegitimate their work as militant, partial, engaged, lacking professionalism, lacking capacity of reach, among other other uh, bad qualifications. And here you have an image of one of uh, main Brazilian television uh, debate television show that is called Roda Viva. In 2013, during uh, an important wave of, of national protests, they, this program they called the alternative media from Media Ninja, this, this guys in the center of, the, of this uh, circle. These are communicators from Media Ninja. They were invited to stage under one question that was, is it journalism? So instead of exploring the experience of being able to cover the protests all over the country from a bottom-up perspective, they were required to justify what made them legitimate to do so. Um, and I would say that part of this delegitimating discourse is true. Uh, they really lack uh, stability from what we can see, from what I, in general, and from what my research confirmed. Uh, for instance, uh, this small community radio in the northeastern zone in Brazil, uh, in 2013, I was there. This radio is called um, Rádio Ibiapina. It is in the city of Florânia, and it is the only media outlet in the whole city. In this very poor arid region and they went out um, of working for a week after a strong rain that drowned equipment and they had to wait that they would dry under the sun so this is a kind of situation that we see a lot in this so they really lack uh, stability and structure and another example is Hajo Floresta in the in the Amazon region in a riverside community and when I was there in, 20, in 2015, they were close to interrupt their, their work because they were running out of solar batteries. That is the only source of, of uh, in electricity in, in the whole region. So, but these is situations, even if they confirm this lack of stability and structure, they, are more, they talk more about structural inequalities and it means another uneven struggle. And it is also true that they are partial and engaged, as, we, as, as criticism uh, says, but beyond attachments to social struggles of varied natures, they are actually engaged in a struggle around agency in the field of journalism and around the production of meanings in the society. This image that we are seeing comes from the Landless Workers Movement, and it states that they are occupying the latifundio of airwaves. And latifundio is a word in Portuguese for uh, standing for huge portion, portions of land belonging to one or few owners. And this is the place from which I raise my argument here about media movements and how these initiatives uh, challenge the field of mainstream uh, journalism. Um, in short, what I would say is that the findings suggest uh, six perspectives from which media activism, or popular media as I call them, challenge mainstream journalism. I won't have time to explore in detail each of these perspectives. You can take a look on what uh, I put in this um, working paper in, on our shared uh, folder. But I'm talking about ideology, uh, when, and, and they highlight the importance, of, the importance and need of taking an openly uh, assuming side while producing information. They talk about territory, and this is, this is related with, uh, they consider uh, the place, um, territory as the place where social perspectives emerge. And so they highlight the importance of taking the sources on board to, uh, to build narratives. Um, there is the aspect of technology, and this refers to access and agency, meaning the right to use any kind of technology useful for the social group. 
as well as the right to choose the one that makes more sense, independent of being it considered rudimentary or outstanding. Uh, they talk about format, and this follows the same logic as uh, of technology, highlight highlighting as well agency and, and access, but it, it includes a claim for not associating formats as belonging to social groups or territories and understanding the appropriation of mainstream models under the perspective of mediation. Then there is belonging, and this notion refers to the need of considering sources from the very context related with the fact and supporting the production of information from local and regional contexts. And then there is resistance, and this summarizes the agency over devices and languages with the engagement with social changes, uh, social changing processes. Uh, you're, at, you're at 12 minutes now. Uh, okay, um, I'm close to the end. And since yesterday, I'm thinking about how all this uh, perspectives uh, dialogue with the model of inter interventionists, uh, in the words of journalists that we saw yesterday, although my guess would be that this perspective of professional journalism that we saw yesterday is different from what media activists um, present here as development journalism. Um, and what is in the title of, the, of this presentation? It is this notion that comes from different um, uh, actors that is this idea of poor journalism that I associate with a grounded media activism. And I consider it a summarizing notion. Um, as we can see in this, in this quotation here, uh, it summarizes a claim for more interventionist journalism, to use the term that we learned yesterday. And mainly, it, it describes this appropriation of media as a way in which social movements and grassroots communities engage in a struggle around the definition of social order, fighting general power asymmetries. So uh, to conclude, I want just to raise two points. Uh, so recovering this idea of media movements and concluding with them, there is the issue of agency uh, over journalism. It refer refers to the problem of being subjects or objects of the journalistic narrative. These people, they are frequently depicted by mainstream journalists without, without almost no agency, as we can see in this quote from a communicator in the periphery of Sao Paulo. They normally either are depicted as vit victims when they suffer oppressions or criminals when they are fighting it. And the end, uh, the, the second aspect of these media movements refers um, to the struggles around meanings. It is an issue around the method of mobilizing, mobilizing knowledge in journalism. And when I asked a communicator from the Landless Workers Movement why they insist uh, on trying to get mainstream coverage if they are always depicted as criminals. And he compared the occupation of journalism as, 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 as dangerous as occupying land and, as, oh, and also as strategical. And so this is about creating space in media sphere and also about transforming it. And this is all, thank you. And I would love to discuss this with you. Yes, thank you so much, Anna Christina. And uh, I'll open the floor for any questions uh, to Anna Christina's presentation now. Um, I see the, the discussion has been going on uh, after Laysan's, uh, so that's really good, that kind of a vibrant discussion that, that, that followed after. Uh, but uh, would like any questions for this last. Uh, so, one um, if alternative media is easy to access over there uh, from. Lenny, I think. Yeni? Um, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of got lost in the yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, please. Um well from I don't know if you are talking about access uh, in relation to audiences or in relation to research. If it is about audience, um I would say that digital 
um, platforms have increased the access, so it, they made access easier, but um, so for instance, during 2013 protests, they got enough visibility, visibility to challenge some, some mainstream narratives and, and they were celebrating this, like when mainstream media started to cover the protests saying that uh, it was about vandalism and it was about uh, destroying vi the village and, 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 and provoking a lot of confusion. Uh, this alternative media using digital platforms were able to challenge this and, 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 and influence the way uh, protests were covered all over the country. So uh, digital media, digital platforms help to increase this access, but we can see a lot of, uh, of filters and a lot of, of um, false impression as, as well, because when, during my research, when I was in these small villages in the Amazon or the north, northeastern uh, region in the country, many of these very small community or grassroots uh, um, media initiatives, they were trying to go online because they believed they could get more access. But, but then there is a lot of effort and the audience does not correspond to what uh, they are looking for. And as well, there is a lot of, they, they play a, a very important role in this, in this local context. And when they go online, they talk, they use it to say, oh, now you can listen to us, you can read us in Europe. But if you see, if you look to the neighbor, they don't have internet access. So this, this issue of access is very tricky because yes, digital platforms help to increase access, but strategically speaking, uh, it is something that should be better discussed. Thank you. Uh, then I have a question from uh, Liriam Sponholz. Um, uh, and uh, starting with, I just have an issue similar to the point of parasitic news yesterday. What are the boundaries between media activism uh, slash alternative media and the producers of parasitic news as Maya Mefale in Brazil or Uncensuriet in uh, Austria? Mm -hmm. We know that these are different, but in which, in which empirical indicators can we anchor this difference? So yeah, big question there. <laughs> yeah, th this is a very interesting question. And this is something that I started to explore after 2018 elections in Brazil. Because during this research, there, there is a concept that I started to work with. This, uh, this is the concept of dissonance. Uh, because most of these, these actors, they believe a lot in the power that they can have uh, creating some breaking points in the, in the mainstream narrative. Like if they reach some access and they they are able to make some noise, they create a, win a window of possibility of changing some opinions, of changing, changing um, perspectives. And then I was calling this, coming from, from these social change actors, I was calling it solidarity dissonance because they were, what, I, what I see that is different from what, what, what the cases you mentioned, Lirian, do is that in the case of this, these actors, they are trying to build diversity and they are trying to, to uh, build ties between groups. They are trying to, in a very Freirian sense, they are trying to build dialogue. And from 2018, what I was uh, starting to discuss related also with this concept of dissonance is that this other kind of platforms, they also try to, to create dissonance. They also try to break mainstream uh, perspectives. But what they try to do is to destroy the other. So they are not, in, this, this is a difference between solidarity dissonance and what I'm calling as restraining dissonance. I'm not sure yet about the name of this, of this, uh, this category, but one tries to, to build in diversity and respect that there are different positions and, and build together a dialogue and the other one tried to eliminate the, op the opposition narrative. So this is a different, I think there is a difference in the kind of, of um, dissonance and the kind of change that we want. One tried to bring, build 
build on in diversity and the other one try to build on in the in elimination of the of the different ideas thank you um i think these are really interesting issues and i think i have a question that kind of digs even deeper into it uh from darsana v um who asks uh uh how do you connect your research to the question of media authority do these poor journalists have the authority to define the boundaries of journalism? Can they revise journalism to include a pro pro poor commitment? Yeah, yeah. I think I think this is yeah, it, yeah they are really related with this. This is what I'm trying actually to develop with this uh, exploring these categories of dissonance, because it's always um, this issue of making some noise and and building another narrative or including an, an alternative narrative to the to the debate but this I, what i think i use a lot a lot paulo freire in this discussion because paulo freire has a, a, a notion of the authentic word and there is a word that that try tries to destroy the other it is the word of domination so i will break the narrative but it is just to to replace one narrative with a new one. And so we are still in the, in the field of domination. So I'm not trying to dialogue here. I'm just trying to impose another perspective. And when uh, these groups, what they are trying, when they try to build solidarity dissonance, they are trying to say, there are different perspectives that must be considered and we must build a dialogue between them. The, between them. And this is what Freire calls the authentic word. This is the word of dialogue. This is the word of, of um, diversity. Uh, and I would say that what, what these groups, they try to push in mainstream journalists, in, especially in Brazil, and that's why I, I introduced the discussion with this framework of inequalities in the media sphere in Brazil. These actors, they, they are looking every day to a very unequal media sphere in a very concentrated media sphere so they are pushing to have more diversity in this in the, in this context extreme right movements they go through the same door i would say but they are not trying to push diversity they are trying to replace one narrative and put theirs as the main one and have a new domination in the in this in the in this media sphere Thank you. Um, we only have time for one last question. There are lots of questions here, so you have, lo have lots of things to look forward to whenever uh, we finish uh, talking early. Um, uh, from uh, Lizen Guazina, uh, is it possible to identify the uses of disinformation in the content of Brazilian alternative media? And you only have like 30 seconds to answer this question, <laughs> so <laughs> go on. Uh, well, 30 seconds, I would say. Sorry. Yes, we can see. I didn't explore it a lot. I explored more how they, and this is something that I'm trying to discuss a bit in, in the COVID context, how this group, these groups identify this information and try to work inside communities to preserve good uh, sources of information uh, within them. But this is really a big topic. Maybe we can continue after this debate. Thank you for the Thank questions. Thank you for discussion. So th thank you so much for an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to the third paper uh, by Katie Parry and Beth Johnson from the University of Leeds, uh, talking about uh, humbug and outrage, the perils of invoking the memory of Joe Cox MP and what it reveals about the emotional political atmosphere of the UK Parliament. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much and good morning. Um, I'm going to start before handing over to Beth. Um, so it seems like a very apt time to be giving this paper at a time when Boris Johnson's government has caused further outrage in its plans to renege on aspects of the withdrawal agreement with the EU, with ministers admitting that it breaks international law. So we now cast our minds back to this time last year to another moment of high emotions. And we're not the only ones interested in this moment. And um, there's actually a, a radio documentary on that will be broadcast on Saturday this week, which covers what it calls the day Brexit hit boiling point. So we can see how its notoriety is, is being amplified further. 
So this was the first day in Parliament after the government had been found to have unlawfully prorogued Parliament, with Boris Johnson returning from the US to give his statement in the Commons. So rather than directly address the Supreme Court's decision, other than to state that they were wrong, Johnson lambasted Parliament for its dithering and delay, claiming all he wanted was a Queen's speech to set out the government's programme for life after Brexit. The scenes which followed Johnson's statement were described as some of the angriest ever witnessed, at least since sessions were televised. The Prime Minister faced multiple calls to moderate his language. In a moment much commented on in the press, he dismissed observations by female MPs that they had received threats echoing his rhetoric on Brexit as humbug. And possibly aware of the potential provocation, he also touched a raw nerve by stating that the best way to honour Joe Cox's memory is to get Brexit done. And for those who don't know, um, Joe Cox was a, a Remainer Labour MP murdered by a far-right extremist during the Brexit campaign. So we'll return to those scenes later, but you might wonder why this one moment deserves such attention. We believe that it offers an illustrative and crit critical moment which relates to some of the greatest concerns that we have about British political culture. Not only that, but it's a taster of what was to come with the governing style of the Johnson administration and which we're living in the midst of right now in the UK. So what are the themes that we explore in this paper? We're interested in the gendered nature of these exchanges and so situate our study in feminist research. Secondly, we're attentive to the emotional registers and the affective atmospheres of Parliament. And third, we situate our study in a performance approach which highlights drama, testimony, storytelling and style as central to political meaning. So whilst we've started to analyse the newspaper coverage from this event and found lots of interesting things there as well, but today we focus on the parliamentary performance itself and start to develop our thinking around the notion of political vulnerability. So we therefore see this as a key moment for a number of reasons, but not least for the questions it raises about standards of political discourse and legitimate public debate. So both Labour MPs Paula Sheriff and Tracy Brabin reported a spike in abuse and threats following this very event, reaffirming the dangers for women in public life who are deemed to have stepped over the line in breaking emotional codes or conventions of behaviour. So before handing over to Beth, I'll briefly outline some of those key theoretical foundations for the paper. So we follow others in approaching politics as competing narratives, shaped in a specific performance style, and with mediated repetitions accentuating certain actions, which in turn works to clarify their significance and moral value. A focus on performance allows for analysis beyond the linguistic content of political speech with attention to style, form, gesture and use of physical space and Geoffrey Alexander's work is, is particularly influential here. By paying attention to the performative function of speech acts, the emphasis is on the way that political actors anchor their performance in existing cultural shared contexts but at the same time enact new possibilities of meaning. So the ways in which proffered narratives resonate and gain momentum or stickiness is dependent on the qualities, of course, of the speaker and the evaluations of their political performance. So Julie Boyce Kay's recent book on gender, media and voice opens by tracing the histories of women's public speech in Western culture recounting the often brutal ways in which women's voices are silenced or shamed. And of course, times have changed, but modern day women politicians would recognize what Kay calls communicative injustice of having to navigate the contradictions of speaking out in public 
So, and many academic studies echo findings on the sexist language used towards female leaders, such as Hillary Clinton and Julia Gillard. So Kay's conceptualization of communicative injustice extends the oft-cited double bind of, of Hall Jameson faced by women in public life. And the focus on emotions and if in, in political and social life is our final strand. We're interested in the relational and performative role of emotions in mediated political culture and the way in which intensities of emotion, authenticity of feeling, and affective energies are articulated as part of political performance. So it's in the affective atmosphere generated in these parliamentary scenes that takes us beyond individual personalities and their performance of emotions. As the institutional space in which the representatives of the UK population legislate and scrutinise government, the affective atmosphere of the House of Commons offers a microcosm of a nation where moods of belonging clash with feelings of division, anger, and indignation. I'm going to hand over to Beth now. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Paula Sheriff starts her contribution um, criticising the pejorative language used by Johnson about the Benn Act, and then makes the connection to the death threats and abuse received by MPs, which echo his language. In making this shift, she says, we stand here, Mr. Speaker, under the shield of our departed friend. So not naming Cox directly, but signifying the importance of her statement by pointing and making this reference to someone whose life is commemorated within the House of Commons. Sheriff's launch line conjures the opening words of a memorial service, signalling a portentous tone, but clearly angry, she points at the Prime Minister as she recounts the words betrayal, traitor, whilst behind her in the televised version of the debate, we can see other women saying, they do, they do, as voices on the opposite bench heckle Sheriff. As she finishes with, he should be absolutely ashamed of himself, Labour MPs stand and applaud her, breaking parliamentary rules. Sheriff's delivery is markedly emotional in that her speech is fast, passionate in tone and at times broken and uneven. Sheriff's tenor rises as a speech continues and at times is audibly close to breaking. Her breathing patterns when she speaks are not measured and in noting we must moderate our language and it has to come from the Prime Minister first, we hear a distinct gap. Now, while in script, this gap might appear planned, a dramatic pause, so to speak, its delivery as spoken sounds unpolished and unpracticed. It's a faltering that can be interpreted as both authentic and a signifying vulnerability. What can be understood as an error then in deliveries furthered when Sheriff notes that the Prime Minister should be shame ashamed. Again, this accidental speech act works to evidence both her labelling of Johnson and perhaps her own feelings, signalling the unrehearsed and unrestrained nature of her emotion in that moment. In contrast, Johnson offers a competing account of reality and his humbug response is a performance on two levels. Firstly, of his indifference to the stories being told and of his refusal to capitulate to care. Johnson's relative stasis in delivery, an open-armed grin on standing and then the placement of one arm carefully behind his back, as well as the consistency of tone that he uses in his nomination of humbug, undermine and rebuff Sheriff's emotional account. Through a measured response, Johnson attempts to depress and simultaneously agitate this politicised space. Where Sheriff's speech sought to make visible the low moral standards of the Prime Minister and in so doing create an intense, reflective and memorialised mood, albeit via a high intensity speech, Johnson's low intensity performance usefully shifts the atmosphere, at least for him, creating a playfully superior yet high pressure environment. Here, Johnson's dismissive response serves to draw on and draw out gender differences, positioning, positioning Sheriff as an emotional, unruly woman, in contrast to his own deliberate, calculated and calm, masculine approach. Johnson's performance seeks to undo the power of personal, emotive storytelling, situating it as inauthentic, subjective and feminised. His own response, in contrast, keeps him at the centre of Parliament, of outrage or support of power. 
When Tracy Brabin speaks, further invoking what Kay would call communal social power, Johnson responds by upping the emotional ante. He says, of course, there'll be an attempt to try and obfuscate the effect of this act, the Capitulation Act, the Surrender Act, or whatever you want to call it. It does, well, I'm sorry, but it greatly enfeebles this government's ability to negotiate. What I will say is that the best way to honour the memory of Joe Cox and indeed to bring this country together would be, I think, to get Brexit done. I absolutely do. End quote. Johnson's attempt to um, dismiss Sheriff um, and Brabin's calls whilst repeating the very language that they're worried in encourages further abuse shows him digging in against their pleas. In addition, he opportunistically co-ops the memory of Joe, Op Joe Cox into his Brexit plan, a rhetorical move that also aligns getting Brexit done with bringing the country together. But his sleight of hand only further aggravates those who knew Cox personally as a campaigner against Brexit. The Labour MP's affected proximity and knowledge of Joe Cox as their friend is cast against Johnson's presumed knowledge of how to honour her memory. But his attempt to speak on behalf of Cox is opportunistic. His evocation of what political action could honour Cox is strategic and cynical. He enfolds her imagined wishes into his argument. 12 minutes now, Albert. Thank you. Um, Johnson's surrender, capitulation and humbug recalls what Smith et al have recently dubbed strategic populist ventriloquism, when established political actors commandeer the populist baton and adopt a language of insurgency, often at times of crisis. In working to provoke a physical shot through speaking for cops, Johnson shifts the political atmosphere again, moving the debate away from his propagation failure, a failure that points to his own vulnerability, and toward the vulnerability of others. In the field of disaster studies, vulnerability is often divine, defined through Wisner et al as above. And this definition or understanding retains its legibility when transferred to a political environment. Notions of anticipation, things spoken about by mostly female MPs, pointed not only to abuse that had gone before, but to their present and future anticipation of abuse. In this sense, they see and anticipate the disaster of divisive language, but in calling Johnson out, they seek to render the events as distinctly man-made, an unnatural disaster that could be avoided. In asking for a moderation of language, they seek not only to change the lexis of the Brexit and prorogation debates, but to shift the syntax and registers. In invoking emotion through storytelling, they enable and curate an effective atmosphere attached to a discourse of care. In this paper, we started to work through the notion of political vulnerability and how this connects to, to voice, care and gender. To conclude, the political significance of this moment is not captured through the script alone, but in the effective atmosphere generated through the interactions and the pressure that builds due to the dissonance between the women MPs' concerns and Johnson's response. The story of Joe Cox's death provides the symbolic reference point through which we might judge the performances of the politicians. The women invoke their departed friend with reference to vulnerability, but also to care. And the notion of care as a political category is receiving renewed attention from writers such as Judith Butler and the Care Collective for grounding into dependencies over difference and the social and political organisation required to preserve lives, uh, sorry, nurture people and the planet. In contrast, as, Johnson, as the Johnson administration has dealt with a real crisis in 2020, one of the recurring evaluations is that the government not only lack moral responsibility, but they also seem indifferent to the accusation. They do not appear to care that we think they don't care. This might seem an inconsequential moment of parliamentary performance, but one could argue it characterises the governmental strategy in the last year. Let's see what we can get away with. In this turn to shameless politics, achieving authenticity, ringing true, or even demonstrating a concern that people believe what you say, appears to be destabilising how we might evaluate a successful performance. Thank you. Thank you, and that was perfectly on, on time, so that was, that was wonderful. Um, I have a question already from uh, Namita Nagpal. Um, um, who wants to know whether it would be fair to call this a discourse study? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Beth, do you want me to 
um, comment. Um, yeah, so we haven't really mentioned much about um, methods, and, and I think we were we're combining really the ideas of cultural pragmatics from from Jeffrey Alexander's work on performance with discourse. Um, but I think um, we want to kind of move that because I think, as, as Stephen Coleman has argued about political discourse analysis, that what it captures is very good in terms of linguistic content but if you want to kind of capture something about the atmosphere and the emotions and style and form of performance then you need something in addition to that kind of discourse analysis yeah so it's, it's in this combination of perspectives that uh and where you actually go beyond the, the mere language and then and into to the context of what's uttered um Lots of praise in the chat so far, uh, not many questions. So I invite you all to, to bring them on. Um, I was thinking about uh, Alexander uh, um, in some ways works. He, he talks about you have the, the discourse and then um, the, those who utter the discourse are not necessarily in, in control of the reception uh, and it might hit different groups very differently. Uh, and I know that's not really within the scope of your study here, but perhaps you could say something about how, um, but perhaps mostly how, how the, the feminine discourse here resonates, but also uh, Boris Johnson's. I mean, I guess one thing that we could um, add is, is originally we'd, we'd hoped to have done the analysis of the newspapers as well. And we have collected um, the newspaper coverage of the event. And this is one way in which we can see um, the ways in which the um, performance is evaluated. And obviously another way is, is doing kind of research with audiences. But the mediation and media reporting is one way in which we can see an initial evaluation. And I think what comes through in that is that initial um, shock of the moment and, and actually quite an agreement around uh, Johnson's kind of indifference and complacency and some condemnation of his performance. But then what we see is the right wing press in particular starting to shift that slightly so that we do see some of those aspects of communicative injustice that we've noted in, in reference to female performance in particular. Um, so Alan Sugar, for example, um, calls them ranting women and calls Paula Sheriff that insane woman. Um, and Charlotte Gill in The Telegraph um, says they're anim almost animalistic in the way that they're snarling at Johnson and talks about their haughtiness as well. So we can start to see um, some ways in which there's an initial sense of this being um, a moment. And, and another interesting point from the newspapers is the amount of times they refer to the gasps in, in Parliament. So again, it's a, it's a non-verbal kind of bodily reaction that is commented upon as, 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 a, as a kind of key um, aspect of um, the affective atmosphere. Um, but we also then see, yeah, some ways in which the right wing press, the more supportive of Johnson, attempt to turn this onto Parliament itself as being, as Geoffrey Cox had said earlier that day, a dead Parliament, um, again, using very inflammatory language. This idea that the Parliament itself is what is toxic and what has become useless and therefore needs to be changed. Um, so we can see a shift there in terms of um, seeing where the kind of blame lies, so to speak, who has responsibility for this kind of toxic discourse. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And I think in particular, um, in, in Katie's reference to the, 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 the articles that came out of this and the various journalistic stories, I suppose it's useful. One of the things that we, we, we are also doing is thinking um, around this concept of authenticity um, and even just going back to the sort of etymology of that, you know, one who acts with authority, the way in which the, the gendered um, understandings and narratives around, in particular, Sheriff and Brabin, um, but there was also other female MPs who obviously reacted strongly, but also spoke on that day, how, how their... Um, how their act of um, storytelling and um, uh, and collective storytelling, drawing um, drawing in particular um, uh, 
female strength and female vulnerability together um, has resulted um, in um, narratives which very much position them um, as um, uh, being uh, inappropriate, acting inappropriately, acting without authority, acting in, you know, going back to very traditional narratives, you know, women being essentially um, uh, mad, uh, bad, you know, based separate unable to reason and that real sort of disconnection between reason and emotion that's being drawn out through very gendered lines here mm. highly interesting stuff um i think we'll we'll end with one one last question and then you will have more questions that you can look into um afterwards um uh it's from david uh uh, do you have any evidence about how more supportive outlets like the Mirror, the Guardian covered these moments? Were there any problematic features or they're all a bit more sympathetic coverage? Um, as I say, we've, we've started to look into that. We've looked at um, within the week of the moment happening, we, there were 97 um, articles that we've already looked at. Um, I think at the moment we were just kind of interested in picking out those kind of key features um, around um, the, yeah, the discourse used really. Um, there's a, a few things that kind of initially have come to light. One is when they do talk about Joe Cox's murder, um, how they refer to Thomas Mayer, um, her, her killer. And that's quite an interesting in terms of discourse analysis, um, the way in which um, the right wing press tend to say he was he had far right views rather than being a far right extremist or um, in in that way. Um, I wouldn't say uh, I can't think of anything in particular of what was it the problematic features. I mean, I think that would be really interesting to look at um, further down the line. But yeah, we are we are starting to analyse this, and the other thing is just kind of picking out the um, the ways in which the journalists almost use quite hyperbolic language. So, um, for example, Dominic Lawson refers to it as a Hieronymus Bosch painting. <laughs> um, so the metaphors and the figurative language is, is really interesting as well. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. We are definitely interested in, 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 in those metaphors and in the ways in which different aspects of the symbolic are sort of drawn in to um, try, and, um, try and narrate um, this, this, this moment. Thank you so much. This was such an inspiring study and then you have so, so much interesting go coming down the line. So um, we really enjoyed it, all of us. Uh, and, uh, go into the feed and continue the conversation there and with that i'll hand it over to uh, christian again <laughs>